Come on. Our Girl Scouts are helping out today. Thank you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, we have begun this journey together. 40 days of the Lenten season in which we will focus upon the trial and the suffering and the agony and the death of our Savior. Our goal is to prepare our hearts and minds for the, the joyful celebration that Easter is meant to be. But let's be honest, how many of us have walked this road for years? Every year there's an Ash Wednesday and every year there's a Good Friday and every year we, we go through the same stories. We know the Bible passages by heart. We're familiar. It's not new to us. But think about those first disciples. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, Judas. They knew none of this. Everything that they were experiencing, they were doing so as new and for the first time. That helps us to understand a little bit of the struggle they had. You see, they had their idea about the Messiah. It had been taught for generations. The Messiah was going to come and be a dynamic, powerful world leader. He was going to drive out the Romans, and he was going to reestablish Israel and give it the prominence and the pride that it had in the days of David and Solomon. The idea of the Messiah being humble, the idea of the Messiah being a servant, the idea of the Messiah dying, these were images that did not equate with their understanding of the Messiah. Thus we understand the struggle that's taking place in our text. The text that we have before us is, it comes around the heels of the text I used on Ash Wednesday. Jesus has been with his disciples. They've been teaching uh, the crowds. And in a moment of, of solitude, alone, away from the crowds, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, who do people really think that I am? Who do they say I am? And the disciples are quick to answer. Some say you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some say you're Elijah, the prophet, or maybe one of the other prophets. 
But then see, then Jesus asks the all important question. Who do you say I am? Challenged with that question. Having known Jesus now for some time and experienced his ministry, Peter anxiously, boisterously, speaking on behalf of the other apostles, makes what we have grown to call the great confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The greatest confession that they've ever made in their lives. In that moment, they put into words what they've been struggling with in their hearts. I mean, talk about exciting news. The people of God have been waiting for hundreds of years for the Messiah to come. And they have now, for the first time, actually said it out loud. Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. I mean, their hearts are pounding, their heads are spinning. What does this mean for us that the Messiah is actually here? And then Jesus opens his mouth to teach them. And what's the first thing he teaches them? After Peter made that great confession, the very first thing Peter teaches them is about his death. The very first thing Jesus speaks of after the great confession is I'm going to die. That did not compute. That didn't make any sense at all. And the Messiah is supposed to be a warrior. The Messiah is supposed to be a conquering hero. The, Maya, the, 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 the Messiah is supposed to be a man of valor. There was nothing in their concept of the Messiah about death and dying, about suffering, about resurrection, anything at all. And so Peter, boisterous as he is, who had spoken on behalf of all the apostles and made the great confession, feels it's his responsibility to set Jesus right concerning his role as the Messiah. That's basically what he's doing. He's going to set him straight. He takes Jesus off the side and rebukes him for talking about his death. That's not going to happen. It's not supposed to happen to the Messiah. To which he receives from Jesus the strongest rebuke that's possible. Get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. He calls him Satan. Why? You see, the devil had tempted Jesus with the very same temptation. Not in so many words. But you see, there after his baptism for that 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus is there and Satan comes to him and tempts him. Do you remember what they were? Turn these stones into bread, you're hungry. See all the kingdoms of the world? Bow down to me and I'll give them all to you. Jump from the pinnacle. Show everybody you're the son of God. He'll give his angels charge over you. See, the temptation is exactly what Jesus speaks to Peter about. The temptation is real. The temptation is powerful. Jesus is fully human in every way just as we are and he feels those temptations. And what is the temptation? To do it man's way, not God's. He tempted Jesus on the mountain with that temptation. He tempted Jesus through Peter with that temptation. Don't worry about doing it God's way. Do it man's way. Do it the way of the world. Take control. Take charge. Get done what you need to get done. You don't have to be the Messiah that you were originally intended to be. You can just do it your way. Doesn't that sound good? Do it your way? Is there, is there anyone here that wouldn't want to rise above the fray and be absolutely, totally in charge and control of everything? I mean, think of what we could do. We play a game in our house sometimes around the dining room table. If you were president for a day, what would you do? Man, they don't like it when it's my turn. <laughs> I tell them all kinds of stuff that I would set straight. What would you do if you were in control, in charge? And wouldn't it be nice to look at those around you and say, jump, and they have to ask you how high? You see, that's man's way. And the temptation coming to Jesus from Peter is the temptation to set aside who God has appointed him to be and take control and take charge himself and do it his way. 
And that is a challenge that every one of us face every day of our lives. How is it that Satan works to tempt you and to keep you from fulfilling your God-given purpose in life? The Apostle John, in his epistle to, uh, it's called 1 John, writes about this. He lays it out very simply and yet very profoundly. I want you to hear the words. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. He lays out three things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. The, this is the way of the world. And this is what Satan uses to tempt Jesus on the mountaintop, Adam and Eve in the garden. And it's the way Jesus works to tempt you in your life every single day to keep you from fulfilling your calling given to you by God. And they're not that hard to understand. Lust of the flesh. We live in a society, in a world that is captivated by fleshly desires. I don't know if you ever did any research and stuff like this. I did for this sermon. Do you realize that the porn industry is a $97 billion a year industry? That's billion with a B. $97 billion a year is spent on porn. $14 billion of that in the United States. We are a society that is captivated by fleshly desires, and it has its consequences. It crosses all ethnic lines. It has no regard to, for economics and no, no specificity about age. There are little kids in elementary school looking at porn on their cell phones, and it is reaping devastating effects. It teaches people to have false expectations. It sets up false hopes in their hearts. I've begun to, to ask couples oftentimes as I get to know them if they're using porn before I'll marry them because I know it'll cause problems. It will cause difficulties in their relationship together because of what it does because it creates an addiction and it always proclaims there's something better and more and more exciting out there than what you have. And the trickle-down effects are seen all over. Our young girls today are taught, if you want to be beautiful, you have to be sensual. You have to be immodest for guys to look at you and want you. And guys, they're taught, girls want sexual attention. The idea, the very concept of a couple remaining abstinent and saving sex for marriage is almost non-existent in our society, and yet is exactly what God calls us to. But you see, we fall into the trap of doing it the world's way instead of God's way. And we see what it does. It brings the repercussions of unwanted pregnancies, abortions, single parent homes, which all escalates the heartache, the hardship, and the hurt. We can talk about other things. Drugs and alcohol offer the, the, the sense that we'll have fun and it won't hurt anybody, but we know what those do. Add to that sensual things like gluttony, extramarital affairs, all kinds of things. And what do you have? You have a world filled with people which are captivated by the lust of the flesh. And I tell you today, Satan is doing a really good job in accomplishing what he desires through that one avenue of temptation alone. And yet John identifies three for us. Having talked about lust of the flesh, he says lust of the eyes. That would cover everybody. Certainly in our society, if not the whole world. We live by the model of more. Because Satan has taught us to always look to the horizon and see what's available and never be content and satisfied with what I have. And so we strive for more, always more. There's always a bigger house, a newer car, more clothes. I'm going to get a little bit personal with you. Ladies, do you really need a $500 purse? Gentlemen, do you really need a $100,000 pickup? Okay. You see, we see, we want, we get into the discussion. That's how we live our lives. 
because what we see with our eyes captivates us and Satan is using that temptation to get us to focus our lives on us, what I want, instead of what God wants. And he's, we still haven't talked about the biggie. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Pride is at the heart of every other sin. It was Satan's first sin. Satan, in the glory of God, looked at God, looked at himself, looked at God and said, I am better than God is. I deserve what God has. And he fought a battle against God to try to take from God what belonged to him. Pride welled up in his heart. It infested his heart and caused him to believe he was better, superior, more wonderful than even God himself. And Satan uses the sin of pride in our lives the very same way. You see it every time somebody looks at someone else and says, I'm better than that person. I deserve more than that person. You see it when one nationality berates another, or you even see it in our own society when bigotry rears its ugly head. It is so easy to fall into the sin of pride which elevates ourself above everyone else. That's what Satan was trying to get Jesus to do, to do it man's way. You don't have to be the Messiah that goes to a cross. You can do it your way without going through all the suffering. That's what Peter was trying to get Jesus to do. That's why Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Peter was saying, this death stuff, this cross stuff, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Do it your way. You see, pride is even at the heart of every false doctrine and every heresy that the church has ever experienced because pride says, I know what I believe I've decided for myself. I'm wiser than Scripture. Pride always elevates self even over God. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Every temptation you will ever face comes through one of those three avenues. It's exactly how Satan tempted Jesus. It's exactly how Satan tempts each one of us. And you know what? He's good at it because we often give in to it. We get mad because God wants us to be something else. Matter of fact, a lot of people choose to just ignore God's will and God's calling in their life. They just kind of decide that God's not really the kind of God I want. So they make up a God according to their own imagination. Well, you know what? God is God, whether you like it or not. And Jesus is not the kind of Savior you want him to be. Jesus is the Savior you need. He is a savior from sin and the reality of what sin has done in this world. And having set Peter straight by rebuking him, Jesus then teaches what it means to be a servant, what it means for his disciples to answer his call in life. And here's what he says. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever desires to lose, loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. You want to know the calling of discipleship? It is to take up the cross and follow Jesus. There's a story told years ago, and it's a fable, granted, but I think it helps us understand something. It's the story of a little boy who worked with his father in a carpenter shop in Jerusalem in the first century. And their job was to build crosses for the Romans. And it sounds horrible for Jews to build crosses, but it was a contract, and his father kept explaining to him every time he objected, this is how we put food on the table. There are a lot of people working for the Romans, and building crosses is just one job. And so the little boy reluctantly did his work in the carpenter shop, helping his father build crosses for the Romans. One day the father entered the shop, and the little boy's over in the corner just bawling his eyes out. And the father went to him and said, son, what's wrong? He said, I went to the marketplace and I saw Jesus, the, the man we like to hear preach. He was carrying my cross. 
They took him to Golgotha, and there they nailed him to him. They nailed him to it. They nailed him to my cross. His father said, son, no, no, you're wrong. There are a lot of people that build crosses. It wasn't the one you built. He said, yes, it was, Dad, because when you weren't looking, I carved my name into it. And when Jesus passed by, he stumbled and fell right in front of me, and I looked, and I saw my name on that cross he was carrying. They crucified Jesus on my cross. What does it mean that Jesus went to the cross? What does it mean that Jesus is the Savior you need, not necessarily the Savior you want? Not a marshmallow, not a savior to let you do anything you want, but a savior that came into this world for the purpose of accomplishing for you what you could never do for yourself. What does it mean that Jesus went to the cross for you? It means that God loves you. It means that God was willing to sacrifice everything for you. It means that God sent his son into this world to suffer what you deserved. When Jesus went to the cross, he took our judgment, he took our guilt, he took our punishment, he took our hell on himself at the cross. And so in a very real sense, your name was carved into the cross that Jesus hung on because it was your sins he was dying for as he hung up on that cross. When Jesus talks to his disciples and tells them he's going to die, he said, this is the way of God, not the way of the world, the way of God, to be a servant, to follow in his footsteps, to give your life and to death for others. That is what God has called us to do. It won't always be easy. Servanthood is sacrifice. Can you imagine the president of the United States waiting on you at your table? Or the governor of the state of Texas washing your feet? Can you really imagine God hanging on a cross for you? And yet he did. So he calls us to pick up our cross and follow him. I want you to understand what that means. Jesus died so that you can live. Understand that? Jesus died so you can live. His call to you as his disciples is that you now may die, that he may live. You are called to die, that he may live. Because it is his desire to live in the hearts of people still trapped in the bondage and the deception of the devil in this world. He went to the cross and shed his blood for every single person. And some people still lo live life as if this world is all there is. And if the pleasures of this world are the only reward we can look for. And Jesus died to give them life. And you have that life through faith in the blood he shed. And now he calls you to die to self that he may live through you and touch the hearts of other people and bring them to faith that he might abide in their hearts as well. It's a life of service. It's a life of sacrifice. It can times be a life of danger. It can even be, the, be a life that calls us to physically die. But it is the life that every disciple of Christ embraces. A life to die to self that Christ might live in this world. It took a while for the disciples to get it. They didn't understand it when they first heard it. But when they finally understood it, they began to realize what it meant to die to self and live for Christ by picking up his cross and following him. And as they did that, they changed the world. May the world never see us. May we die to self and Christ live in us and may the world see him. May Jesus live and the world forever be changed. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and the life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.